I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and answer your questions about the Second World War. Uh, Johannes Promponas asks, what happened to the Allied ambassadors in the Nazi-occupied countries? What about the Allied ambassadors in Soviet-occupied countries? Um, it is the job of an ambassador to represent their state and maintain diplomatic relations in the country where they are posted. But a state of war between two countries means that diplomatic relations have failed. So while it is the ambassador's job to deliver declarations of war, after they've done that, they don't really have much to do anymore. Most simply return home straight away or are sometimes forcibly expelled. Most can do so unharmed, but complications do arise. Like with the case of the British ambassador to Germany, Neville Henderson. He was a big uh, appeaser during the whole appeasement period. But as it is his job, he still delivers the British ultimatum on September 3rd, 1939. He plans to leave Berlin along with the rest of the embassy. But on his way to the Dutch border, he and his staff are interned by the Gestapo. They want to hold him as a bargaining chip until the German diplomats return safely from Britain. For four days, Henderson is trapped in his train, and a small crisis develops on what will happen. Eventually, the German diplomats arrive by steamer, and Henderson is allowed to proceed. Most British ambassadors to the nations conquered by the Nazis still have a job to do as well. With the establishment of governments in exile, they have to liaise between these bodies and the British government. So, the British ambassador to Norway is still the British ambassador to Norway, he just works in Britain with the Norwegian government in exile based in London. Some wartime ambassadors do face unemployment though. Uh, the Nazis allow the Danish government to keep running. There is no government in exile. However, the British ambassador to Denmark is forced to leave Copenhagen and return to Britain jobless. The same is also true for the ambassador to Latvia. Well, he's also accredited to Estonia and Lithuania. These countries simply ceased to exist in 1940 when the Soviet Union annexes them and Britain quickly recognized this. So this diplomat is also now unemployed. Poor guy, tough times all over. Anyhow, uh, Ralph Lewandowski asks, what was the German reaction to the Soviet Japanese neutrality pact of April, 1941? Well, it was actually quite mild. Um, this pact is signed April 13th, 1941 in Moscow by the respective foreign ministers, Vyacheslav Molotov and Yosuke Matsuoka. It dictates strict neutrality for the next five years and it's pretty mutually beneficial. Joseph Stalin doesn't have to worry about a Far Eastern Front. Japan has secured its northern border. Back in Germany, Hitler's plans to invade the Soviet Union are in full swing by this time. So the news of the pact well, it's not exactly welcome, but it doesn't really change his plans. A month earlier, he actually met with Matsuoka in Berlin, and he tried to woo him with the usual Nazi pomp of military parades and things like that. Um, Hitler does this because he wants the Japanese to move south against the British, pushing for an offensive on, on Singapore or British Malaya. But Matsuoka disappoints Hitler, telling him, at the present moment, he could not, under these circumstances, enter on behalf of his Japanese empire into any commitment to act. Fun fact, Japanese diplomats and statesmen often refer to themselves in the third person, considering it the most polite and formal way to speak, hence the he and his. So this seems to suggest that Japanese assistance doesn't really figure into the plans for Operation Barbarossa, and all that Hitler wants from his allies is a push in the south. In fact, Hitler doesn't even bother telling his Japanese partners about what he has planned for the Soviets. He believes that Germany must more or less stand alone in its quest for hegemony. So he's just not that bothered about Japan pledging neutrality to the Soviet Union. And it's not like he sees non-aggression pacts as things which can't be reversed anyway. I mean, he doesn't intend to stick to his with the Soviet Union, so he probably assumes if he needs to, he can just pressure Japan to abandon theirs. Corbin Gull asks, why was Norway invaded but not Sweden? Well, at first glance, it might seem pretty odd that Germany never invades Sweden. As you'll know, though, if you've been with us since spring 1940, a big reason for Hitler invading Denmark and Norway is to secure the supply of Swedish iron ore from Jelivare and Kiruna, which accounts for two-thirds of German iron production. 
So why doesn't he invade Sweden as well? That way his iron ore could be even more secure. Well, the Swedish government are all too aware of this possibility. And so they are pretty cooperative with Germany, even as their neighbors are invaded and occupied. They keep exporting iron ore to Germany and allow German troops and supplies to move through the country en route to Finland for operations on the Eastern Front. Maintaining independence is the priority. Their strategically weak position helps them here as well. I mean, they got Denmark and Norway on one side, which are Axis controlled, and Finland on the other, which is Axis aligned. That means Sweden can never be an effective base for the Allies. So it's not really a threat to Germany. So it makes no sense for Hitler to invade Sweden when he has what he needs from it anyway. And why commit all the men and resources to invade it and police it afterwards? They can be used elsewhere. And as the war shifts to the Balkans and Eastern Europe this year, the Nordic countries become less of a focus. Swedish neutrality is looking more and more secure. While Sweden is neutral during the war, many Swedes are not. And if you want to see how Swedish volunteers fought for Finland during the Winter War, you can click here for a weekly episode about that. It is entirely thanks to our Time Ghost Army and their support that I can continue sitting in the Chair of Infinite Knowledge, answering your very interesting questions. So, join us at patreon.com and timeghost.tv. If you would like me to answer your question, post it at community.timeghost.tv. That's community.timeghost.tv. I like doing things like that that the editors have to do or else I'll look stupid. I hope they don't make me look stupid. See you next time.